Hi, uh, and I'm Joe Folkman, and welcome to today's webinar, Reinventing Hybrid and Identifying the Risks and Rewards in 2024. Um, let's do some introductions to start off. Uh, you know, we have with us today myself, and, and uh, I've got two experts with me today. Uh, you know, first of all, Mike Adams and and Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself and and your history and and uh, what you're doing currently. Yeah, sure thing. So, my name is Mike. I'm uh, the founder and now chairman. I actually recently replaced myself as CEO um, back in October. So now I'm in, in the chairman role of uh, the company I started called Grain. Um, Grain is a recording conversation intelligence tool, uh, primarily for sales teams to record their calls so that managers can give feedback and see the status of the content of what happens in sales calls. Um, before that, I was in the education technology space, uh, co-founded a company called Degreed, and that's now kind of in the HR space, and then a company called Mission U. And I live with my wife and, and three kids in Southern California in a little town called Laguna Nagal by the beach. And uh, yeah, happy to be here. Oh, thanks so much, Mike. And you have a new dog. <laughs> we do. We have a new puppy named Finn. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. And, and Anthony, for context of this call, uh, my my team is um, hybrid. We went we went from fully in person, or I would say remote first in San Francisco. COVID hit. We went fully remote, and now we're back to I would say kind of a remote first. But I'm fully remote. The rest of the team is uh, a bit split. But we can we can get into that. Okay, thank you. Anthony, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. My name is Anthony Jenkins. I currently work uh, as a senior product manager for Amazon. Prior to my experience at Amazon, I worked for Honeywell and then Lockheed Martin prior to that as a federal contractor. Um, I, I've been remote personally as an individual contributor and as a manager for the last, uh, coming up on nine years. And so I've got some experience in this space and uh, happy to share some of the insights that I have about what it's like to be on a team or to lead a team remotely. Wow. Thanks, Anthony. And we'll, so we, I've got two experts. They're living the dream. Uh, the third expert is Debbie Morris, and Debbie is our senior client executive, and she's the chat host. Debbie, any instructions for uh, participants today? Sure. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, if you have any questions, we definitely encourage them. So type them into the chat and I will try to get back with you right away. And if not, we will get back with you just as soon as possible. Enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Debbie. So let's jump in here and we want to start with a poll. <laughs> and this is a, you know, it's like love it or light, love it. I mean, it's like, uh, but I'd like to get a little sense about your particular situation. So most of the time I work in the office and I love it, or most of the time I work in the office and I dislike it. I, again, those are pretty broad, you know, kind of uh, tough definitions, but tell us where you're working from and do you love it or do you dislike it? And uh, I don't know, this is going to be an interesting poll. Uh, Anthony, Mike, any guesses about how this is going to come out? I, I wanted to vote, but it says hosts and panelists can't vote. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you know, I would we... guess it's going to be most of the time work from home and love it. It's my uh, my guess. Okay. Would be All right. Okay. There's a little bias there, Anthony. Yeah, I, I'd be surprised if anyone if there if we get many that say most of the time they're in the office. I think there's a lot of hybrid and work from home, but we'll, we'll see if they like it or or, or dislike it. Well, we'll see what, what comes out here. So here's our results. And we have, uh, you know, the the 47% uh, working in a hybrid situation, part-time in the office, and uh, they love it. And, and uh, but some don't, uh, about 6% uh, don't like it working remote. And, and, you know, then we have most of the time I work from home uh, which is uh, item three, but and they love it. And uh, then office workers, we have about 10% office, 33%, uh, you know, kind of uh, work from home and 47% in a hybrid kind of situation. So 
that's that's kind of close to what we found in our research. So let me tell you about pros and cons of remote work. Uh, pros of remote work, it's flexible. Uh, it allows you to work and, and, and you got that flexibility. Cost savings. Uh, a lot of people you know, don't like uh, the commuting. They don't like the parking. They have to dress up to go to work. Increased productivity. Now, this is uh, interesting because we're seeing some studies that, that say that sometimes productivity is decreasing. Others that it, this is debatable is, it, in terms of where it's at. Uh, wider talent pool. Uh, Atlassian, which is a you know remote work company, uh, indicate uh, that uh, they're significantly they're they're getting more offers and more acceptance to offers to work for them because they are a remote work organization. And then finally, the reduced commute stress, uh, eliminating the daily commute. Uh, I did some work for the the Philippines with the trade association there of call centers. And they were telling me the average commute is two hours each way. Uh, that's amazing. So kind of when letting people work from home, save people four hours in their workday. That's, that's amazing. Uh, guys, any, any reaction to some of those? As someone that does some hiring, uh, I definitely think number four is worth, uh, Worth, worth emphasizing that uh, you broaden your talent pool if you're able to not restrict by geography or where someone's willing to relocate to. And that's been beneficial to some of the teams that I've been on to diversify those teams and to reach out and obtain some talent and that joins the team that probably wouldn't have otherwise without that uh, flexibility of remote work. Oh, thanks, Anthony. Mike, any, any other? Yeah, I would, I would, uh, echo the the talent pool it, it even especially in a hybrid world you know we found as we're starting to hire people more in person before covid we had a five day a week requirement in the office and now it's two days a week in the office and it really increases the range of how far we even within kind of the utah geography that we can hire mm -hmm. um of, because people don't mind commuting a longer way if it's two days a week, whereas they would really care if it was every day. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have found that like certain roles don't need to come in at all. So we have all of our engineering is fully remote and that has worked extremely well. And that's allowed us to hire people in Africa, across Europe, um, in Mexico. Um, and they're really talented people that we, we wouldn't obviously be able to have otherwise. Wow, the world is your oyster there. It's all right, so what are the cons of remote work? Well, isolation. Sometimes it gets lonely uh, working alone and in your home and stuff like that. Commuting uh, communication challenges. Uh, some studies have said between 70 and 90% of what's being communicated is nonverbal. <laughs> so you don't you don't always get that on on remote work. Uh, blurred boundaries. Uh, for some remote workers, they never can stop working, you know, so it, it's tough to, you know, then you need a boundary when you go to an office, that's where you work, and then you go home and it's different. Technology issues, uh, I think that's significant. I was doing a coaching call last week and uh, the internet met, internet went down at the end of the call and it turns out some guy was, he was, uh, he was servicing my furnace and he ended up unplugging the router and that, that yeah, gets crazy. Uh, but uh, people do have technology issues and then the lack of supervision. Uh, some people struggle with accountability. Uh, any any kind of comments on, on these challenges of the cons of uh, work, remote work? The, the isolation one, I think, is real, and people need to acknowledge that. I think a lot of people experienced that during COVID when most everything was shut down. Uh, but I also think there's some tips that we'll chat about a little bit later about how teams can still get together or provide that sense of connectivity, even if they're in a remote or a hybrid setting. Uh, but some of these other ones are just things where it's probably good for all of us to level up our skill set anyway, as far as crisp and clear communications and expectations, setting clear boundaries. Uh, all those types of things. Uh, so I, I think there's there's 
opportunities with some of these cons as well to say, where can we improve? Where can we level up that would benefit us whether we're in person or not? Okay. Mike, anything else? Yeah. One of the things we talked about in the practice webinar that really stood out to me and I agree with is that a lot of the pros and especially the cons are context dependent on the stage of the company and the stage of the individual in their career. And that the earlier stage individuals and companies benefit, I think, a lot more from the in-person collaboration and problem solving and and just the camaraderie that you kind of need when you're getting something off the ground and you don't need it as as at that same level of um, kind of what we called the taco truck at, 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 at Grain when we had an in-person um, in San Francisco. Yeah. And um, kind of same thing with people being earlier in their careers, you can really benefit from some of that. Um, kind of in person, but once you're a little bit more established as a business, you're more established in your career, like most things can move to remote. So I think a lot of these kind of cons, uh, the pros and cons are are pretty context dependent on the on the stage of the company, the stage of the individual in their career. And and Anthony, you uh, you told me that the first job you had, you worked in the office and you said, boy, I'm glad I did. Yeah, uh, and actually see in the comments here, we've got some... Uh fellow Department of Energy folks on here. So I was a federal contractor right out of school, and it was a great opportunity uh, to support the Department of Energy uh, and, and work with Lockheed Martin and have in-person mentorship when I didn't really know which way was north, right? People could help me, uh, teach me, uh, kind of ride along, sit in their office, listen to calls, uh, whatever it might be. It was very beneficial for me. And then I think that expanded where I maybe took the training wheels off a little bit and was able to go off on my own a little more and be ready for remote roles. And so I do think there's a time and a place for these. Uh, and, and part of the challenge here is the execution of when and with whom in your organization uh, do some of these opportunities pop up. Mike already talked about how they identified their engineering group. Certain roles may uh, yield uh, better results in a remote setting than others. And so it's just an awareness and a consciousness of what's going on in your career and in your organization to know where to best execute this strategy. True. Well, one of the research articles we thought interesting, Catherine Hahn, she did a, 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 a sort of a meta study where she looked at a bunch of different studies and we're gonna see the numbers all over the board here. But in her analysis of what's going on, she found 12% working remotely, 28% working hybrid, office was 59%. The interesting thing that they found was this 98% of workers <laughs> want to work remotely at least some of the time. I think that's an important page holder. Of There's a, there's a really strong preference for some remote work. And uh, in another study, and this is a study I trust a lot, uh, uh, one of the authors here is Nicholas Bloom. Nicholas Bloom did the original research on remote work uh, at a company called C Trip, was in which was in China, where he did a random selected study of who was remote and who wasn't, and found really positive results from uh, the remote work uh, audience that they they had a pretty positive experience with it. Um, in this study, what we're gonna see is they surveyed 19,248 workers in 34 different countries. So this is a global study. Here's what they found. They found 50, 45% of the, the, the folks were working remotely, 45%, and then as you can see, 12% uh, one day a week, 14% two, 8.3, uh, three days a week, 5.9, four days a week, 13% were fully remote. So you see the red line is for remote, the dark black line is for office. Now, here's the kicker. They ask for preference and what people preferred, and here's what came back. When they asked people how many, what percentage wanted to work in the office, it went from 45 to 18 percent, and the the percentage that wanted to work remote went from 13 to 25 percent. 
there is a preference there for at least some remote work. Anthony, Mike, does this surprise you? And what what about this study? Did you, did you kind of point out, or what 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 really uh, comes out as strong to you? I think it's little surprise that people want to work more remote than they're, I would say, enabled to. And so yeah. that's like the bigger trend. And that, you know, in general, um, I, I like to see, and it really reflects my experience that anything can really work and it's all context dependent. So even from sometimes it may be necessary for zero days, but the majority of times I think in the, you know, two to four days a week, or even if you're fully remote up to five plus days a week makes sense, but I, I'm not surprised. And I think it's, it's encouraging to see that, um, you know, there's a lot of, of variance here in, in how many days a week people are going in. One thing that I'd add, uh, not specifically about this data, but just the approach, I think it's helpful to understand what's reality, what's actually happening. And then what's the desire of the employees? And it doesn't mean that you have to change things exactly to align with whatever someone's wish or desire is. But if there are disconnects, that's probably going to lead some to some frustrations or maybe some unspoken um, concerns or dissatisfaction that these employees may have. And so it's an opportunity for leaders, whether you're office, hybrid, or remote, to just understand what is the desire of the employees and your team and then find ways uh, where appropriate to make adjustments that may help uh, improve employee satisfaction as well. And so just the awareness of what's happening and what the desire is and some of the gaps, that could be some opportunity for team building, some improvement uh, in the workplace as well. Well, and the Rolling Stones taught us you don't always get what you want. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Which I think is a good lesson. And, and, you know, I read an article this morning on, you know, the, the expectation of turnover in 2024, which was super high. And I think this is part of the problem. Uh, we have some CEOs going, I want everybody back in the office. And and we have other CEOs who are, who are very comfortable with remote. So this is a debate. You know, we're living in a period where Work has changed significantly in the last two or three years. And, and this is a really a fascinating experience we're all going through here. Uh, in their research, they uh, ask people about the benefits of working in the office. So socializing, face-to-face -face collaboration, clear boundaries, better equipment, time with the manager. You can see those were all uh, uh, kind of benefits of working in the office. And then benefits of working uh, remotely. And number one, no commute. Uh, number two was related to commute, you know, kind of you know, save on gas and lunch, flexibility over when I work, less time getting ready for work, which is an interesting thing, you know, which tells me there's lots of folks out there working remotely that are still got pajama bottoms on. I'm guessing, I don't know. Uh, so Mike, Anthony, and you know, you don't show me. I don't want to see it. <laughs> and spending time with family and friends in fewer meetings. All right. So organizations, uh, Google uh, extended its remote work policy to the pandemic and announced a hybrid work. Uh, Amazon announced plans to return to the office. Okay. Now. Anthony, you work for Amazon. Tell me about your experience there. Yeah, so I was actually hired into a remote role pre-pandemic. Uh, so I've, I've worked here for about seven years. And so the expectation for me hasn't happened. I, I kind of joked with my manager that you can't return to some place you've never been. So uh, the return to office, uh, I was exempt from that and continued on as fully remote. However, um, there are some people who were hired during the pandemic uh, and I think that one of the challenges is uh, being clear up front about what role people are hired into. I think it's the change that really causes some friction uh, when someone is under the assumption that I was hired into a remote role when, in fact, they were hired into an office role, but it was just during the pandemic, right? And maybe there was some lack of communication. So it just underscores the importance of the communication and setting those expectations up front. Uh, but right now at Amazon, uh, it, it's it's three days a week that most people are coming into the office. 
uh, when they are uh, assigned to one of our regional offices. Thank you. That's very helpful. Apple, uh, you know, they're they're having kind of a hybrid situation. Now, JC Mor uh, JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Diamond has been very vocal about returning to the office and has been, you know, very strong on that, as uh, uh, David Solomon uh, in, in Goldman Sachs uh, really made a strong push to kind of get people back to the office. And then Microsoft is in a hybrid situation. So organizations are in different places on this. Uh, a week ago, we heard from, uh, you know, the chairman of uh, a bank here, a large bank, and he's just pulling his hair out. Uh, trying to get people to come back to the office they, and and you know when when you have a bank you need people in the office and uh, it's hard to have that those uh, roles be remote so uh, we've done a lot of research and one of the the really smart things we did uh, is before the pandemic we started asking people whether they were working in in remote jobs or in the office jobs and so we collected data, and this is data from individual contributors. And this comes down to the question of productivity. And these are manager ratings of productivity from office workers and remote workers. We don't have a huge sample here. It's not, it's not as, as large as many of the studies that we do, but it is interesting that in the case of the manager here, managers rated uh, people that work remotely as more productive and having taking more effort or, or, or really being exerting more effort. And then uh, when we looked at all raters, uh, they were the same. The, the uh, remote workers were rated as more productive and giving more effort. Anthony, Mike, does this surprise you? I think it does a little bit. Um, it's it's easier, I think, to... At the end of the day, like, the best work environments are evaluated by their outcomes, not their output, right? And that yeah. can be evaluated, I would say, just as effectively in person or remote. But the advantages of being in office is there are these other kind of um, just presence-based signals that... Um, are usually associated with performance, even if they're not actually, you know, a causal, they're more corollary. And so that's why I find it a bit surprising. Um, and, but at the same time, also not that surprising because it just, it, it's showing that the evaluation of productivity uh, would have to be based more on outcomes and, and delivering the results than output of just like how many hours in the office. Do you think that, uh, remote workers sort of have a, 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 a stronger sense that I've got to demonstrate, I've got to show you what I did because you can't see it. And, 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 and is that part of what we're seeing here? The fact that, you know, because you can't see it, I'm going to tell you what I did today. I'm going to let you know, I'm going to show you the data. I don't know. Anthony, any, any comment there? I think there's, uh, that's part of it. Uh, we we've shown earlier that people want to work remote they've indicated and i think there's probably a level of hey if you're letting me work remote i better i better do my job i better hit my targets or else maybe this privilege or what however they view it uh, could be taken away the other thing i wanted to call out here when i look at this is there could be some uh self selection going on here in the sense that some early early career folks that may not be as productive but are ramping up uh, those may be the people who are more likely to be in the office than those who are maybe mid to late career with remote. So that, that could in, influence the numbers some here. Uh, that Those are the first thoughts that I had looking at these numbers. Well, that's good. Good, good point. There's a little watch out here. And that is that when we looked at the data and we looked at people who are rated in the bottom 10% on effort, effort and productivity, the combination of both of them, we found only 7.5% of them were in office situations, but 20% were in remote work. And I guess this brings up the point that not everyone is more productive working remotely. 
And has it been your experience that some employees are not cut out for remote work, that that you ought to look at this carefully? And 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 Mike, as you think about your employees, do some of them struggle working remotely? Yeah, I mean, I've been pretty vocal. Um, I posted on LinkedIn about this a, a little over a year ago about how I struggle working remotely just in terms of my own focus and productivity relative to being in an office. And so um, it's tough. And so I have to go, I have to create all sorts of kind of um, guardrails and parameters when I don't just have what I've, um, my background is in education and I always called kind of cohort-based learning environments, the container, just having this container of other people and, and timelines, the office is a container, which has just kind of a lot of benefits that come with it in terms of accountability, um, supervision, et cetera, that you don't have when you're, when you're fully remote. So it, it takes, I would say more focus and more discipline and some people need more, I would say of the container kind of benefits than others. And I do think it is very dependent on the individual. Their kind of, I would say brain chemistry is a big part of this. I know that's a big part of why I struggle with, you know, remote, um, I have more of an orientation towards, I would say, being what I feel like is the best version of myself as a leader. Um, when I'm interacting with people in person, we're hanging out over lunch. Um, I, I struggle with the with the isolation um, and the focus uh, as an individual. And I know that people on my team struggle too. So it's very dependent upon individuals because I've seen other people that just thrive. They do their absolute best work because they don't have no, no distractions and they hate the you know busyness of being in the office. So it very much depends on the individual. Yeah. Anthony, when you're hiring out there, any watch outs for you, you know, when you think about you know, you're hiring people remotely? Yeah, I, I alluded to this earlier. Part of this could be uh, if people are forced to be remote and they don't want to be, uh, it's probably no surprise that they're not a, a top performer there. So Again, I just want to underscore, in my opinion, the importance of helping people understand what the role is and what the expectations are from the onset, and that can really help lay the foundation that way. There's some uh, great comments that I'm seeing as well, where uh, basically just helping the bosses understand and managers understand who your people are and where they will best run. Uh, you know, think about sports analogy, you know, not everyone's a quarterback, not everyone's on offense, right? You gotta, you gotta figure out what position people should be in, where they should be and where they can thrive. So I think those are all key things to, to keep in mind, especially when hiring. Oh, good point. So here's what we found. It's interesting. Uh, again, when we looked at the effectiveness on uh, 19 competencies, the remote workers got higher scores. And, and again, that, that's really impressive. Uh, now, what about, we're going to switch here. These are direct reports of managers who work remotely and in the office and how the direct reports feel. Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, we found on two engagement items, the direct reports of people that worked remotely were significantly more positive. Now they're not like incredibly, yeah, that's the differences here aren't huge, but they they are meaningful and they're statistically significant. Each person is treated with dignity and respect. Uh, the remote workers, they felt the direct reports felt like they they were treated more with dignity and respect. And my work environment is a place where people want to go the extra mile. Remote workers, felt like uh, they were encouraged to go the extra mile. Now, office workers, <laughs> they felt uh, they, they felt more confident that the organization would achieve its strategic goals, uh, which is interesting. It's like because they're in the office, they, they get uh, more of a sense for that. And let me just show you the next slide because it talks about the competencies. So in... Uh, in the office, the office managers were rated as significantly better on strategic perspective who were in the office, the office managers, but the remote managers were rated significantly better on learning agility, collaboration and teamwork, 
displaying integrity and honesty. And then two that were fascinating to me, building relationships and valuing diversity. It was the remote managers that were rated significantly better on those two uh, variables. I find that interesting. I'm curious, Mike and Anthony, do you have a theory for what's going on there and, and why these things are happening? I'll let Anthony go first. So if you look at that first one, uh, strategic perspective, I do think being in an office around other leaders in particular helps with setting company culture and strategy. Um, that's tough to argue against, in my opinion. Um, I, I saw a comment earlier too that said it seems like the the pros of of uh, uh, or the, the benefits of office work seem to benefit the corporation, and the benefits of of remote work seem to benefit the employee. They don't have to completely be at odds, but I do think I do think there's something there that being together in an office helps the organization as a whole. I think, and perhaps uh, remote work helps the individuals. Uh, but it can be balanced here. But the strategy is absolutely essential. And that one stood out to me. But the values diversity, I think that makes sense, too, because the diversity is not just uh, what you see. It may be people's uh, living situations. Maybe they're caring for children or elderly parents or whatever it might be. And that can be part of valuing that diversity as well that can stand out a little bit more when you've got remote options. So I can definitely see uh, the the different nuances here of how, uh, from a strategic perspective, being in office would would uh, rate more highly here, but why you know building relationships and diversity may uh, be more valued uh, when it comes to remote work. Yeah, Mike. Any any addition to that? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, what I found with remote is you have to be better as a manager. Like it just takes more work. It's it's you have to, I would say, be more intentional and deliberate. So one of the things that I think happens around kind of the strategic perspective is the osmosis of being in person is I'm, I have, I tend to be kind of an oversharer, like I'm super transparent and open and just anybody ask me anything or uh, something comes up and I'll, I'll, I'll share far more than I would say is, is probably normal from a, a founder CEO. And that happens more often in person because the circumstance is there, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in remote, like everybody hates hanging out remotely. <laughs> like it's horrible. <laughs> like, oh, these like, you know, office hours or donut or whatever it is. Like we've tried them all and it's just like super forced. The, the, like once a month game things have been like, okay. But like, because you don't really have that remote social um, a lot of times it's harder to kind of get into these more serendipitous types of conversations. So the only kind of strategic alignment you have is the official presentation of it, which tends to be a little bit more buttoned up um, and can be harder to feel like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're really um, getting, I would say, the, the, the raw perspective and that, that trust that comes with kind of that openness. At least that's been kind of my experience as to why perhaps the strategic perspective feels like it's a bit stronger in an office than remote. Yeah. I, I'm curious on, you know, because I, I originally thought that remote workers would have a tougher time with relationships and diversity. Uh, and yet the data seems to suggest that, you know, remote managers are better at those two. And I wonder if that just comes because the managers realize they have to connect. They have to kind of, you know, they, they have to make an effort. When you work in the office, you just, you see Bob or Sue and you sort of say, oh, they're, they're, they're fine, you know, and, and you don't sort of make the effort to reach out and connect and sort of check in with people. And I don't know, is that, is that part of it there? Do you think? I think so. Mike used the term serendipitous interactions. I think those are extremely important and very hard to replicate from a remote standpoint. However, you also need deliberate interactions, right? And I do think there's situations where, yeah, a manager may have bumped into me in the hall and it's like, oh, well, we don't need our one-on-one -on -one anymore because uh, I said hi to you or I sat <laughs> next to you uh, at lunch. Whereas with remote work, I feel like it's a little more uh, prescribed and deliberate with the interactions that I've had with leadership uh, and those, those meetings 
aren't aren't substituted or canceled maybe as easily. And so that's the balance that I think needs to take place there. Can it happen in the office still? Absolutely. But I think that's just one of those key things that I mentioned earlier, a skill set that should be leveled up is that any manager, remote or in person, should have carved out dedicated time where they have deliberate interactions to talk about employee satisfaction, to talk about things beyond just status updates. Uh, I, I'm reading the chats and Lindsay, I thought, had a really good comment, um, which is, is it harder to be a remote manager or does it require a different set of skills? And I think that's a really like, great question. Like. I, I, I said, I think it was it, that it's harder. I think her comment is actually a little bit more accurate that it is, it's different. Right. And so depending on the individual, because we all have different leadership styles, we all have different work styles. And so that word harder is probably biased towards my perspective. I personally find it harder to remote really manage a lot of what, based on what Anthony was talking about, I'm more of a serendipitous person. I'm more of a like kind of shoot by the hip person. Other people are a lot more like deliberate and intentional and methodical. And so that that is challenging to me. I have to develop a new skill in a remote environment because the medium kind of requires that deliberateness because you don't get the, the serendipity as often, which my personality and kind of work style, you know, I would say is it's it's better suited towards. So um, it's I, th I, th I thought that comment um, in in the chat was 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 worth comment it was worth worth recognizing as a uh, thank you Lindsay. Okay, great, thanks Mike. Well, the other thing we found is when we just looked at direct reports rating uh, office and remote managers, direct reports are significantly more positive uh, on remote managers than than office. Now again. This is 49th percentile, the 52nd. This is not huge. It is statistically significant. And I think it's that reaching out, being deliberate to, you know, kinds of things that help there. So, well, we have another poll. And what's your projection for uh, work location of your organization in the future? Uh, what do you think? Will more work be done in the office? Are we going to? have Jamie Diamond <laughs> lead the day and say, we're going to come back to the office. Uh, more work done remotely or more hybrid? What do you think is going to happen in the future? You saw the preferences. And boy, if we go with the preferences, uh, you'd vote remotely. But uh, there's a lot of office space out there. You know, I we're paying a bill for our office space still, and we're only using it one day a week. That stings a little bit. What do you think? What do you guys think? Where, what, what are people going to vote for the most here? Uh, we'll see, but uh, the trend <laughs> currently seems to be uh, a lot of a lot of hybrid work, uh, where there's some flexibility, but uh, desire to get together on a regular basis in the office. You know, even if it's one day a week, that's still hybrid, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm a, I'm a moderate in all things in my life, so I'm going to go with hybrid. It's the moderate <laughs> choice. Okay. Well, you're right. 57% uh, said more hybrid will be done. 18% said, you know, more remote. Uh, and 25% said more office. So I do think there is a pullback to the office and we're seeing it in some organizations and, and then some kind of saying, no, we're going to pull back to, you know, kind of more hybrid, more opportunities. We're going to even if it's one day a week, that's still kind of significant. Well, and, I, and I think that you'd see a very different stratification if you were to, you know, balance that question off of industry. So like um, I was with the, uh, one of the leaders of In-N-Out Burger the other day. So like we're super hybrid. They are just re uh, religiously in person, like no, <laughs> none at all. And they were super clear about it. Um, going into COVID, since they like live and breathe and die by that position, to to kind of advantages and disadvantages. But part of it is you know the work that they're in, right? So this yeah. is like the corporate side of it in Outburger. But I would imagine that you would get um, you'd get difference, uh, kind of different stratification based on the the industry and the and the job and the role and the function and. And, and I think that's been my overall takeaway is that it's all context dependent and there's no one size fits all. It is a lot. And, and 
you know, I was looking, uh, working with an industrial organization where people had to go in and it was a factory and, and they just pushed people to come to the office because the employees had to go to the factory, you know, and they didn't want to have that disparity between the two groups. All right. So I have some questions for you guys. Uh, first what question is, how long have you been uh, doing remote work? Uh, Mike, you started remote work that's you you started your organization remote <laughs> yeah so it's it's a subtle difference but i do think the details matter so we started as a remote first company in 2018 and what that meant to us and and generally means is that that anybody we hired remotely we wanted to be on the same plane as uh those who are in in office so me my co-founder several others we were in the office, you know, generally five days a week, but you know, it wasn't a big deal if you didn't come in one day a week. But then we hired many of our engineers remotely, but we had a philosophy that was like, we're going to have a setup such that it is as good of an experience as you can have in a meeting when you're remote. And so instead of biasing everything towards, you know, remote, uh, sorry, in person, and then the remote people are kind of left with a second tier experience. Um, we we were very intentional and deliberate about that remote experience being kind of on the same plane. It's it's impossible to make it exactly the same, but but the effort really does matter whether it's built into your mindset or not. Um, and then we went to fully remote with COVID, and now I would say we're back to being hybrid. But I don't know that we're as remote first as we used to be. Like even yesterday, I'm one of the remote, really the only probably remote leader. The rest are all in Utah. And I was the only one that wasn't in person yesterday. And it was a crappy experience. It sucked. Like <laughs> I was like trying to like join the meeting and they were all in person. I couldn't hear. And and that it's not remote first anymore. It was when we started and now it, it isn't. It's something you have to do like really intentionally and deliberately. And, and you know, when you're on the remote side of an in-person kind of hybrid mix, when when something is, is actually remote first, or whether it's like remote accommodating and remote accommodating is, is not a great experience compared to remote first. Hmm. Anthony, uh, what, when you think about this remote first versus remote accommodating at Amazon, where do you feel you guys are? Um, I think it's remote accommodating probably, uh, more likely. Uh, but one, one analogy that might help is anyone that's in a sales role, would know that uh, you can accomplish a lot over phone or Zoom, uh, but there's there's a time and a place to get together with your customer, right? There's a reason we have road warriors that travel around and do those types of things. Uh, and the reason for that is that connection or being able to get deeper. Um, an, another, another quick story is I, when I didn't live by family, we lived uh, actually in Albuquerque for a while. Uh, felt a little isolating but when family came to visit we got really quality time maybe not quantity time but very quality time uh, but then i felt a little disconnected other than that when i live by family i feel like i get quantity time but not always that same quality time and so i think that may be something that you could kind of transfer or think about with your work uh, interactions so when i travel for a team offsite, uh it's it's quality time even though it may only be for a few days or for a week uh, but then I may miss it other times. So there, there's there's different nuances there and there's probably a time and a place for all of it. But those are just some things I want you to think about as you think about your own work environment, whether it's a small organization or a big one and how you might do that quality versus quantity time or try to get a balance of both. Well, that's great. And I love that quality versus quantity. So what do you see as the advantages, Anthony, of remote work or... or, or uh, office work? What are the advantages? Um, for, so I'll, I'll approach it two different ways. From an employee standpoint, I think it's helped me be able to grow my career. So put quite simply, I probably wouldn't be working for Amazon right now if I didn't have the option to uh, work remote. Just the stage of life that I'm in, you know, I have I have children that are kind of ingrained in what they're, they're doing and school, good schools and things like that. So it would be difficult for me to uproot and locate to you know one of three or four uh, cities that I don't currently live in. So it's helped me in my career. From an organization standpoint, and uh, looking at it from that way, 
I, I think if I had to boil it down, probably the key advantage is expanding that talent pool um, and hiring different types of people uh, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. And being able to see other people's careers flourish when maybe they didn't think it was possible to get back into the workforce or, um, you know, that maybe they're from a rural town and they didn't think they'd ever be able to work for a big multinational organization, but now it's possible. So those are the two advantages I'd see from those different perspectives. Mike, you've been able to hire people all over the world, even in Africa. So to, to the engineering and stuff like that. So that's, that's been an advantage for you. What else? Yeah, definitely. And and I feel like as remote, there was different, it costs different things to live in different places. So people's willingness to work for different rates. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we would maybe hire someone in one geography at a certain rate over another. Um, and that is an advantage to the business and an advantage to the individual because they can probably make more working for a San Francisco startup remotely than maybe their 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 local um you know rate prevailing rate so there's that but that arbitrage as remote has gotten more popular has definitely kind of decreased and um i would say the wages have gone up in in some of these other locations relative to um the in person just building on what anthony was saying and and so i have the three kids and and uh, I noticed there was a comment about you know different perspectives which uh you know being an all white all male panelist so I guess sharing at least my wife's experience um, recently is, you know, she's been out of the workforce. She's in finance, CPA, worked in venture capital on the finance team and and left the workforce for 10 years. And um, she just is starting uh, a new job. Uh, it started in the fall. It's moving to full time in April, but it's fully remote. And we used to live in the Bay Area and it was a really tough cost of living for, for our, our situation. And there's just no way we really want to or could move back. But because um, remote, I would say, it's in particular for her company, there was no way that she would have been able to get this job you know, pre-COVID um, and, and have it be fully remote. But because it's fully remote, it allows her to, to I would say, re-enter the workforce in a way where she can find that balance between being a mom um, as, as she's re-entered the workforce. It's definitely like I, I it's changed my relationship with, you know, doing pickups and drop offs as, as, uh, as we're both working again now. And it's a huge advantage, like just from a quality of life, from just presence with our kids and, and being able to have opportunities that you wouldn't have otherwise, like um, companies that I would say are open to it are, are, are definitely getting an advantage of talent because people don't necessarily live in these like kind of high cost of living, challenging um, uh, places to, to to live as much as maybe they used to when when remote is more of an option. Good. Yeah, thank you. So what are some disadvantages? What, what are some things that, you know, kind of, you know, aren't great for either remote or or uh, hybrid? I think Mike touched on one earlier is like the, the individuals that maybe don't thrive in an isolated or remote uh, situation uh, that you, you can't just ignore that and say, well, this is this is how things are now, uh, because that's a significant portion of the population that uh, may not be able to function at their highest level in that setting. And so uh, one, one of the disadvantages is it's not a one size fits all, just like office work isn't a one size fits all. And there's, there's some compromises that can and should be made. Um, but I would say uh, the potential for isolation. I mean, we, we again, we saw it uh, during COVID where that would, that could wear on people mentally uh, and have some s significant negative consequences uh, to, even though people had these superficial relationships online uh, if if you're not seeing people in person, uh, it doesn't necessarily fill you up or recharge you the same way that in person interactions yeah. do. So, how often do you bring your team or, or together, uh, Mike? Uh, do, do do you do that? And and Anthony, with your teams, how much? How often do you have a a, a gathering? So we just had like our leadership team offsite um, and. In Sundance, Utah, we flew our back-end lead from London. So he lives in London. Um, we have someone who's in Arizona. Um, and we flew, I would say, half of the people there had had flown in for it, including myself. And 
We do that like a couple times a year. Um, we've done an off an onsite uh, in Barbados with the entire team, like not last year, but the year before. Barbados was chosen because we had folks in Africa that we wanted to be in person, and Barbados was the best like you know visa <laughs> situation. And ironically enough, despite the fact that that was the best situation. They still had visa issues and not all of them could come. So oh, it was just, gosh. <laughs> it's a real challenge when you, especially when you, you know, are, are, are branching out to different continents. Um, but I would say the cadence has to be at least once a year. Um, but the more, the better. And, and I think it's worth the, the, the cost. One thing that has definitely impacted my mindset is is hiring people that maybe aren't in person, but are within like a, you know, reasonable flight distance away from where the nexus of, of collaboration is in person. So that mm -hmm. um, it, when it's an hour to flight, the frequency of in person can be a lot more often than when it's, you know, going across an ocean. <laughs> Good point, Anthony. Yeah, on our end, uh, I would say quarterly is is pretty standard uh, for big or global teams to get together. Uh, to Mike's point, I've seen a lot of teams that are essentially remote or hybrid teams, but they're they're regional, uh, and that may lend itself to you know the the once a month. I've seen some comments people saying you know once every couple of weeks. But what I would say is make do it as often as is reasonable but have a purpose for it too, right? So if you're just saying everyone in the office on Wednesday and then everyone comes, sits in their cube and puts their headphones on, there's not a whole lot of purpose to that. Uh, it's just checking a box. So have a purpose and a reason for your get togethers. And it can, it can be fun, but also have some work purpose to it too. And people can recognize if it's a, a checklist or if it's something that's actually meaningful and, and productive. So last question, and we've already answered this question about uh, for performers, but... Do you have any advice for CEOs who are asking employees or all employees to come back to the office? Any any advice you'd give? Mike, uh, what would you tell a CEO that says we're going to require people to come back to the office? I would say start with a conversation and learn before you make decisions because what's best for the leader and their style and their preference is not necessarily best for the individuals, not necessarily best for the, the um, even the company. And ultimately yeah. the company is composed of those individuals. And I think that there's a lot of heat on this topic when there isn't communication, when it's just a mandate and they were never consulted, they were never, okay, well, you know, you were told in advance that X, Y, and Z would be the case yeah, but things change, <laughs> like circumstances change. Can we have a conversation about this? Can we like talk through it and find like a kind of a, a balance in the middle? I, the people at minimum want to feel heard and heard out and listened to. So my advice would be to start with conversations um, and get into those weeds and details um, not making promises, but at least, you know, gathering that data on on a per team and per individual basis before rolling out policies. Because, you know, the backlash of that, I think, usually comes from just the kind of top down dictator, you know, dictator style um, means of that happening more so than the actual policies themselves, oftentimes. Yeah, good point. Anthony? Uh, similarly, I would say be transparent improve the communication and connect the dots. And what I mean by that is if you're saying, uh, just come into the office because I said so, anyone that has kids knows how well that works, right? Uh, but connect the dots and say, here's our company vision or our company mission or what we're trying to produce or achieve or where we're trying to win and connect whatever you're asking for, whether that's going more remote, more in office to whatever objectives you're trying to accomplish. And if you can help people catch the vision and understand why behind uh, some of these key decisions that really impact people's lives, that will help everyone uh, get get in line or, or buy into the vision. Or you may even have some people that self-select out of that, right? There's uh, And that's actually probably good to know early on as well. And so I think that the clear communication and connecting the dots uh, is something I would recommend to all CEOs to do uh, to, to explain the why behind these decisions. Mike, Anthony. 
Thank you so much. You've really added a lot of insights and that your experience here has been invaluable. Uh, really great discussion today. Uh, final quote here. Uh, I wanted to work around my life rather than live around my work. <laughs> or remote workers aren't trying to escape doing work. They're trying to escape the day prison. And uh, so those are a couple of quotes that I found really interesting. So to kind of close this webinar, one of the things that we know about leaders is that there's a strong connection between a leader's effectiveness and outcomes in the organization. What we find is better leaders have 50% less turnover. They have 40% higher customer satisfaction and three times more employees who are willing to go the extra mile. We know that if we can develop a leader that outcomes will follow. And we think there's a great way to do that. Uh, we've got an offer for everyone on this call uh, that if you'd like to attend our Extraordinary Leader Sessions, uh, we're having a live online session on the 24th and 26th of April. Uh, so you can do it remotely. And or first time since tw uh, 2019, we have an in-person session in Minneapolis, Minnesota on May 1st. I can guarantee there will be flowers blooming. It'll be great. Uh, and so if you'd like to, 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 one of your team members or someone in your organization would like to attend one of these development experiences that's really life-changing, we can give you a 25% discount. And we have an exit survey. We'd love to get your feedback. We go through this feedback and really appreciate it. And thank you for all that you put on there and your insights that come from the feedback. Uh, if you'll go to this link and, and it should automatically come up on your computer, bit.ly slash ZF hybrid dash exit and uh, complete the survey. Uh, for those who go in and complete the survey, we're going to select five people to receive an extraordinary leader book uh, that we'll send to you. Thank you for attending. I've really learned a lot in this session. And thanks so much to Mike and Anthony. Appreciate your time and uh, you joining us remotely. So thanks so much and have a great day.